The Gospel of Mark, chapter 8, verses 27 through 38. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, Who do you say that I am? And they answered him, Oh, The Gospel of Mark, chapter 8, verses 27 through 38. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist, and others, Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, You are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed. And after three days, rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world? and forfeit their life. Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of them, the Son of Man, will also be ashamed when he comes in glory of his Father with the holy angels. of me, for I am a mere vessel of your word and your will. We are here today to be changed. We are here today to be comforted. May it be so. Amen. It is hard to believe that the day the world stopped turning, the day that seemed never ending, the day that found us in the midst of uncertainty and a lack of knowledge towards the future led us to 20 years of mourning, 20 years of pain, grief, and worry. Friends, I speak to you in the midst of this pain, a message of hope towards the future. A message that comforts our worry, pain, and uncertainty, especially those moments when we wonder what's next and will this happen again. The world changed after this day 20 years and one day ago. The world will never be the same, and we are grateful for the sacrifice of many who with courage went in to save, with hope helped people in the midst of terror, hate, and pain. And our prayers and thoughts are with the families of those loved ones that find themselves numb 
and without hope, following these events that still flash back, that still are continually imprinted on our minds, that still worry us, that still give us a sense of uneasiness, and that still causes uncertainty. Let us take a moment as we pray for those loved ones. Amen. Looking at the Gospel reading from Mark, this passage really is about Jesus laying his life down for each of us. But it can apply in such a state of the grief that abounds 20 years after the devastating attack on September 11, 2001. I am sure that if I was to ask you where you were on that day, each of you would have different responses. And some might even say they were moments from the city. Days like this don't have to be okay. It doesn't mean that grief goes away. Grief is natural and is an important characteristic to go through. As we remember those many that made the ultimate sacrifice of their life trying to save their neighbors. There's a meme that goes around this time of year that says we should have things like they were on 9-12. Today, on 20 years later, on September 12th, it is my prayer that we might come together as a country, as a world, and as neighbors to love others and care for their need and grief. As I shared with you last week, Jesus wept at the loss of Lazarus. It is okay to weep. It is okay to grieve. Each time I hear the soundtrack from the Broadway musical Come From Away, which depicts these events that transpired on that horrific day, I am filled with tears and pain. Personally, I myself was only five years old, but it is heart-wrenching to think about the devastation and the event of riding home on a bus halfway through the school day as a child not knowing what has just happened. As a child in that moment, I cannot tell you exactly what I was thinking, but I remember the news if what had just happened and that uncertainty, that feeling of not knowing as we traveled home to be with our family in the midst of terror. To find comfort in the midst of uncertainty and pain. As someone who has visited the 9-11 memorial and saw the many names engraved in the granite stone in the midst of the living memorial of the beautiful waterfall, a beautiful tribute to their lives, that their families and friends, those grieving, can come together and experience a sense of peace and an abode of hope. It brings chills and pain to the heart to experience that moment, but it's part of the process of grief. I know we are filled with a variety of emotions from that day to this day, 20 years and one day later, just as we were following the events that transpired that 
day. Jesus, our loving brother, our wonderful Savior, helped many in his life find comfort in their most difficult experiences. When he went up to the woman at the well, some would see that she was the issue there. They would say that, friends, I am not so sure about the intent of the woman or the comment from Jesus when he said, you have five husbands. You've had five husbands and you don't live with the one and you're with another person. So let's refresh ourselves. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have no bucket and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob? Who gave us the well and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to drink water. Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come back. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. Here ends that reading. Many pastors, not myself, would say that this is a story about a woman who was not committed to their marriage or was sleeping around. Many like to hear about the drama or the tea of the situations. However, if we think of the story as one of a woman who was troubled, who was grieving, who was finding it difficult to cope with life, Asking for water to drink. Maybe they had past relationships that were emotionally abusive or physically abusive. Maybe they had to make difficult decisions that only themselves could make. It puts into perspective this story more than taking the usual misogynistic and outright wrong approach of shaming the Samaritan woman at the well. Jesus confronted this woman, no matter how many people she was with, for whatever reason. He answered her request of how to find this living water. How to find hope towards the future. When he says that the water he will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life, I do not think that this woman understood exactly how to get the water that she was meant that he, that Jesus was mentioning. 
Sometimes we are like that same person. Maybe we have found ourselves searching for that living water, that hope towards the future. We don't know where to find a bucket, but friends, just like the woman at the well searching, we don't need a bucket. We don't need a pail. We don't even need a tiny little cup because Jesus has given us through the Spirit an overflowing amount of living water. Thinking about the overflowing with the Spirit, one thing we discussed in my first seminary class, which was a few years ago, was the concept that the Holy Spirit can only give you a certain amount. It cannot give you less, and it cannot give you more. This is a good thing, though, friends, because it speaks to the importance of equity in the Spirit. We overflow with what the Spirit guides us to, where the Spirit guides us, and where the Spirit directs our path. And that is such a joyful hope towards the future. The Holy Spirit isn't selective like our human nature to think that we can tell certain people that they decided something wrong or that their love is invalid. We as children of God, beloved and unique, that are giving gifts, unique gifts, are called to bring others that same spirit much like Jesus brought in that passage and the Spirit which gave Jesus the gifts that he walked the earth with, bringing healing in the midst of pain and in the absence of hope. We are called to share that living water with those freely and abundantly, not judging, not saying, well, you're not worthy, or you don't belong, we are called to be an expression of grace upon grace. That grace which was present at our baptism that carries us throughout our life and our journey of faith. In the midst of this moment, in the midst of the grief that abounds, the worry in our hearts, it's hard to do but I invite you, through the Spirit of God, to carry a torch of hope towards the future with Christ's message of living hope guiding the way. Let us be to the world this beacon of hope in the midst of worry, pain, and grief. May it be so. Amen. Let us pray. God, there are no words to express the difficulty of this day, of this weekend. We pray for a healing comfort, a care from your Spirit, which guides us and comforts us in the midst of our need. In the midst of the times where we are in the middle of the night crying out to you. In the midst of our worry. In the midst of our pain. Help us. For we need you. Help us to bring to others a flame of hope. In the midst of of grief, in the midst of uncertainty, and in the midst of pain. 